President, I wanted to rise to continue the discussion which was raised by the Senator from Tennessee relative to the letter which has been signed by all the Republican members of the Appropriations Committee. This is a unique event in my experience. I've had the great honor and privilege of serving on this committee now for uh, 14 years, and I've never participated in this type of an undertaking, which is basically the Appropriations Committee, Republicans at least, stepping up and doing the responsible thing in the area of trying to control the fiscal policy of this country uh, th when the Budget Committee has left the field. It isn't that the Budget Committee didn't, didn't leave the field arbitrarily, it's just that the, the other side of the aisle decided they didn't want to do a budget for some reason. I mean, I, actually, I know the reason. And the reason we're not doing a budget the way we're supposed to do uh, of the country is that the budget shows that we are in dire straits. We're going to have a 1.5 to 1.6 trillion dollar deficit this year. Next year, it looks like we're going to have a deficit in the range of 1.4 trillion dollars. And for the next 10 years, every year, under the Obama budget and under the spending plans of the Democratic leadership of this Congress, we're talking an average of a trillion dollars a year of deficits. That adds up to a doubling of the debt in five years and a tripling of the debt in 10 years. And the American people understand that we can't do this, that we cannot continue that type of profligate spending, that type of out of control spending. But unfortunately, the other party, which now controls with significant majorities both the House and the Senate, is unwilling to step up and produce a budget which brings those numbers down, which makes us more responsible in the area of spending and reduces the debt burden on our children. And so the Republican members of the, of the Appropriations Committee have said, enough. We want to stop this out of control spending. We want to have a spending proposal in place that makes sense. And we've picked a number that is very reasonable. It's essentially a freeze at last year's levels. And it's a number which has been supported, interestingly enough, on this floor when it was offered as the Senator Sessions, Senator McCaskill Amendment on four different occasions by a majority of the Senate. And with all the Republican members voting for this type of a freeze, a central freeze, and with a number, I think between 16 and 18, Democratic senators voting for this. Because there is an under full understanding, at least on our side of the aisle, and by some members on the other side of the aisle who did vote for this, that we've got to do something about controlling spending around here. And so this letter essentially says that before we start marking up any bills in the Appropriations Committee, we have to have an understanding as to how much we're going to spend. Now, is that an unusual idea? Is it a, is it a terribly radical idea? that we should reach a number, an overall agreement on an overall number as to what we're going to spend around here before we start producing spending bills. No, it's not. It's exactly what the budget's supposed to do. But we don't have a budget for the reason that, as I mentioned earlier, people don't want to talk about how big the deficit is around here because they're afraid the American people have already figured this out. We'll just get more outraged about it. So <clears throat> what we're doing and what we're suggesting in this letter and what we're saying in this letter is that we, as Republican members of the Appropriations Committee, expect there to be a budget for the Appropriations Committee, even though there wasn't one passed here, with a top line number being essentially the number in the Sessions-McCaskill, what amounts to a freeze proposal, uh, freezing at 2010 levels, essentially. And that we will test every committee appropriations bill that comes forward on the basis of that number. And that we hope that, the, that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, both on the Appropriations Committee and those who aren't on the Appropriations Committee, will join us in this effort. Because it is a sincere effort and a reasonable effort, since it has already been voted on here with a majority of both sides, with all of our side voting for it and a majority of the Senate voting for it. Uh, it is a reasonable number to set forward as the goal. Yes, it does mean a significant reduction. It does, we've got to be forthright about this, and this is what we, we need to do, quite honestly. It does mean a significant reduction from what the President requested. It means a significant reduction from what the Senate Budget Committee passed in committee, which budget was never brought to the floor of the Senate, because they did not want to shine lights even on that budget. No question, 
it is a reduction, and a fairly significant reduction uh, from those numbers. But it is a reasonable number, and it is an important number because it says that we are willing to be disciplined about our spending around here, and that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to make these types of tough choices, and this is, a, this is an effort by the Republican members of the Appropriations Committee to make it clear that we're willing, we are willing to make those types of difficult choices. Mr. President, I wonder if I, the senator from New Hampshire would accept a question. Yes, I, I would accept a question from the senator from Tennessee. The, um, I would ask the senator from New Hampshire, who served as chairman of the Budget Committee of the Senate and is now the, its ranking member and one of, there's no one in the Senate more familiar with the numbers in the Senate uh, budget. Uh, is it not true that, the, that, that this request by Republican members of the Senate Appropriations Committee comes at a time when many Americans and most senators feel that the level of the federal debt is at crisis levels, threatens the security of our country, and that as it comes at a time when the Congress has not produced a budget, and it comes at a time when there have been substantial increases over the last year and a half in the 38 percent of the budget that's discretionary spending. So would the senator from New Hampshire, who's long served on both the budget and the Appropriations Committee, not agree that the first job of Senate appropriators is not to decide where to spend the money, but to decide how much money there is to spend, especially this year when there's no budget? I think the senator from Tennessee is absolutely right. It, it's, it, how can we run a country and a government of a country if we're not willing to decide on how much we're going to spend and then stick to it? Uh, the reason we're so out of control around here in spending is because every week, every week for the last eight to ten weeks, we've seen a new bill brought to the floor of the Senate which has added to the debt and the deficit of this country. And interestingly enough, eight weeks ago, we passed a bill on this floor with great fanfare from the other side of the aisle called PAYGO, which said that all the bills that came to the floor of the Senate were going to be subject to a test, which essentially said that before you spent any money, you paid for them, paid for what you're spending for. Well, since we passed that bill, over $200 billion, billion, has been proposed or passed by the Senate, which violated the very rule that we allegedly passed to try to discipline the Senate. So it's very clear that unless you set out some hard parameters, unless you set out some very specific spending limits, and that's what the letter from the appropriation Republicans does, you're not going to get any discipline around here. We'll just bring bill after bill out of here, out of committee, and we'll spend money we don't have, and where does it all go? Well, it all goes to our children as debt, and we have to borrow it from the Chinese, or we have to borrow it from somebody else, and then we have to pay the interest on that, and that interest doesn't do us any good as a nation. In fact, under the president's own projections, his own budget, the interest on the federal debt will exceed any other item of spending in the federal budget on the discretionary side within seven years. It will, we will spend more on interest because we're adding all this deficit and debt than we spend on national defense. What a waste of money that is. So unless we get some discipline around here, on the spending side, this deficit's going to grow, the debt's going to grow. I saw our most interesting figure, and, and I think the senator from Tennessee has seen it too. Since President Obama has been president, for every second, every second since he has become president, $56,000 has been added to the debt of the United States. $56,000. That's the, that's the income of, the mean income of Americans today. So every second he's been in office, he's wiped out the income of some American who's working. Because that income's all going to have to be spent to pay off that debt. Well, granted, not all that debt was his fault. But uh, un interestingly enough, as we go further into his administration, a large amount of it is his decisions and the decisions of this Congress, like the $200 billion in, in debt that we've been adding or about to add that violates PAYGO. This week, we're going to take up another supplemental bill here. Um, uh, does the senator know how much deficit and debt that bill will add if it's passed in the form that the administration and the Democratic leadership has asked just this week? No. 
I, I, well, I think it's somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 30 billion dollars of new deficit and debt. Mr. President, I wonder if I could ask the Senator another, another question. He was talking about the increase in debt. Uh, am I correct that the, it took the first 43 president of the, presidents of the United States and the Congresses they served with about 230 years to run up $5.8 trillion in debt, but, the, but President Obama's 10-year proposal through 2018 would add another $11.8 trillion. In other words, the fir am I right that the first 43 presidents piled up $5.8 trillion in debt, and this president's 10-year budget through 2018 would double that? Triple it. Uh, the senator was off by 100%, uh, but close. Uh, in the next five years, the president will double the national debt under his projected deficit, under, his, under the deficits which he's projecting under his budgets. And in the next 10 years, he will triple the national debt. Uh, and as you say, if you take all the presidents from George Washington through George W. Bush, put all the debt that they've added on the books of the United States, through all those administrations, cumulatively, uh, add everyone together, President Obama will have spent, will have added more debt than all the prior presidents added first 43 presidents of this country, just in the first four and a half years of his administration. Mr. President, I have one other question, if I may, for the senator from New Hampshire. I know the, we sometimes hear the American people say, or commentators say, well, why don't those senators work across party lines and, and get a result? And my, my question to the senator from New Hampshire, who has these years of experience on appropriations and budget, if in the present circumstances where we have a debt crisis, and where we have no budget, no budget for next year, and we won't have, would he not agree that taking a, at the beginning of the process, taking a number that has been voted on by a majority of the Senate and has widespread bipartisan support is, is a, a constructive bipartisan approach that ought to be able to gain the respect of Democratic appropriators and Democratic senators, and that we could work together this year to essentially freeze discretionary spending as a first step toward reigning in federal spending. In other words, sometimes we see amendments around here that are called message amendments, each side trying to score a point. Isn't this, isn't this a proposal that that deserves respect as a serious attempt to restrain the debt and that should earn bipartisan support? Well, I thank the Senator from Tennessee for his point. It's, it's absolutely valid. This is a bipartisan proposal for all intents and purposes. It's been voted on. Uh, I think it got 57 votes once. I think that was the most it got. Uh, maybe it got 58. Uh, and there are only 41 Republicans. So clearly it had a, a large number of uh, Democratic votes uh, from the other side of the aisle. Because the number is reasonable. Uh, a freeze is a reasonable number on the non-defense discretionary side at a time when we're running deficits that are over $1.4 trillion. It, you've got to start somewhere. You know, all great journeys begin with a step. And so this is the place we should start, right here by freezing non-defense discretionary spending. And we as Republican appropriators have said we're willing to do it. And I certainly think the senator from Tennessee is absolutely right. This is a an attempt to reach across the aisle and bring in a bipartisan coalition to accomplish this using a number which has already received significant bipartisan support. Mr. President, I, I yield the floor and make a point of order. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.